And he was doing a postdoc at Stanford. And he was the only person I knew that I knew who was doing molecular work. So I basically cold called him and I'm like, hey, will you teach me molecular biology? Pretty much be my mentor. And I've got this, I wanted to study uh, patterns of uh, multiple paternity in Cal Greenling. And he's like, he, he shouldn't have done it, but he's like, sure, I'll do it. I mean, like now I know there's no way he should have done that, but he enthusiastically welcomed me to his lab at Stanford. So Giacomo was trained. I realized that you guys might be seeing my paper in a PhD lab that was among the first to recognize that there was variation in genome organization. And in my opinion, this was the beginning, albeit indirectly, of the deconstruction of central dogma. Because of his background in molecular biology, when I showed him my first sequences of a ribosomal subunit, he was able to infer a pattern of insertions that form hairpin loops just by looking at the sequences. He later turned his attention to looking at patterns of substitution within and between species. So his perspective allowed him to integrate the ideas that there's flexibility and, or, or rather variation in genome architecture, nucleic acid lability, and substitution patterns among marine populations that were not predicted at the time. He was one of the first ones to say, it's not what you think in marine systems. So I have come to appreciate that this perspective is unique and not shared by everyone in our field, and that I've benefited from it in ways that I couldn't possibly have foreseen. So for example, after graduating with my PhD at UC Santa Cruz, I was sequencing some hawks genes from multiple fishes, and I was able to recognize a level of polymorphism that was way beyond what you would expect by sequencing error. And so I realized that I was looking at paralogs from a, a relatively recent genome duplication. And at the time, no one believed me because they're like, no, no, uh, first of all, they were, it was in paddlefish and they were using paddlefish as a non-duplicated reference because they still weren't really accepting or believing that Telios had a, a different genome duplication. But really it was from staring at sequences all these years with Giacomo and looking at these patterns that he is exceptionally good at that I was able to recognize that. And so, as I said, people weren't accepting that genome duplication is not as uncommon as they thought in vertebrates, because it goes back to this old idea of central dogma, the genome is static and stoic, nothing happens. It can only get read in one direction and things like that. So Giacomo is known for really knowing local diversity in a variety of places around the world. When I see him at conferences or more recently on a tiger shark dive in Tahiti, he's always surrounded by a cloud of people <laughs> that follow him around, young and old, some are students, some are colleagues. Um, you know, some of which he knows, some of which he doesn't. And they just, they wanna come up to him and say, I think I saw this, do you think it's possible? So that people are just like following him around. And so I'm telling you this story because I always get a kick out of the fact that I always seem to get some kind of a, a favor and novelty when, when people realize that I know him. Um, you know, like I've traveled places very often remote and people will be like, you know, Giacomo Bernardi? And then all of a sudden, I'm very interesting to them. And they're like, you did your PhD in his lab? What is that like? <laughs> you know, so it's always like interesting to me that, that I get this reaction. So anyway, Giacomo, I'll never be able to thank you enough for all the mentorship and training you've given me over the years. I'll never be able to express enough gratitude. I was thrilled that you were able to accept this invitation to speak today and elevate the caliber of our seminar series at Moss Landing. And I was just about to say to you people, there's a lot of people in my experience who would just love to have a beer with Giacomo and I was gonna invite you to join us, but I've just found out five minutes ago that our happy hour was canceled. So you're gonna to have to uh, have a, some stories about fishes without a beer afterwards. So thanks so much, Giacomo. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Karen, for the a kind introduction. Uh, I don't know exactly what to say, but hey guys, uh, that's uh, wonderful to be here. It's almost my second home. Um, I obviously did not grow up here, but I've spent now uh, uh, a lot of time in this area. What I call this area is anywhere from Alaska to, uh, to Ecuador. And um, 
I really like the, the Eastern Pacific. It's a very interesting place. And when, uh, when Karen invited me to give this talk, um, I thought that I would try to make a, a brand new talk about stuff that I never talked about. And it's what this is. But the problem is that I'm also a procrastinator. So I've put all this together last night. And so, um, I mean, this is just the truth. Um, I don't know what else to say. One of the things that is really great about um, growing up at, the, at my time, growing up scientifically, it's a little bit what, uh, what Karen was saying. When we started, uh, the two of us, uh, molecular biology was really complicated and was just for people that were, that really knew what they were doing. And sadly, uh, those people did not know much about ecology. And now uh, all the techniques are much, much easier. And in a sense, the techniques are not very important anymore, which is a good thing. And instead you can focus really on the biology of the organisms, which is really what matters. So that part is nice. Nevertheless, I really very much enjoy to be in the field and I very much love to be at the bench as well. And so, um, so I'm really lucky to be able to do both of these things. But it's true that when I first started, I actually was looking at my very first things that I was doing a very long time ago in grad school and all the sequences that had ever been sequenced were in a very small book of all the sequences that have ever been done anywhere in the world. So that was a different time. Uh, so today what I was trying to do is to try to summarize with a bunch of different topics with a very uh, thin thread, things that can be done with genetics, genetic tools, and that are somewhat loosely related with the Eastern Pacific. And as I was saying, until a few hours ago, I didn't know exactly how this would work out, but I hope that uh, some of these aspects will, uh, will be of interest. And also, one of the things that is really uh, uh, fascinating and, and so fun with genetics is to be able to be surprised and to uh, test some hypotheses that otherwise are just difficult to, to address uh, with, without those tools. And so, so I will just show th stuff that seems obvious and others that are somewhat surprising. It's in our job, just in case you are not faculty and you're considering being faculty, most of the stuff we do is very, very boring. And occasionally we also do science and it's really fun. And so that's what I'm gonna to try to talk about today. Uh, so this means that, oh, there we go. So today I will try to talk about five different things that uh, were in each uh, section. I will try to just show some examples of what has been done by uh, people in my lab or in, in close collaboration uh, that uh, go from macroevolution, population genomics, local adaptation, assessing the past, predicting the future. I thought that that was kind of cool to, 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 to use those words. Uh, Macroevolution. So again, we're going to talk about the Eastern Pacific. And I thought that we would address three regions in the Eastern Pacific. Um, first, there is a relationship between organisms. I'm sorry, when I talk about organisms, I only talk about the only ones that really matter, which is fishes. Um, I, I know fish a little bit, but the other ones I don't know very well at all. So the relationship between the Western and the Eastern Pacific, between say Japan and California, uh, the tropical Eastern Pacific, and then uh, the anti-tropical relationships between what is in say California and Chile or what is in the Northern or Southern hemisphere. So this is gonna be just the first part. So let's talk first about the Western and Eastern Pacific. You probably know that there's a number of organisms, uh, fishes that are, um, related phylogenetically between the Eastern and the Western Pacific. Good examples of that, but there's many, many of them, is uh, the genus Sebastis, which you all know is, uh, is uh, the rockfishes. Then there is the surf perches, 
amniotosids. This is the family that I mostly work on. And then uh, what Karen has worked on exagramas, which is the green link, but there is also semicosmos. There is a bunch of stuff. Uh, there is a lot of relationships within those things. So when you do genetics, you are trying to figure out exactly how it happened, when it happened. If you haven't read uh, the uh, papers by Karen about uh, Greenling, they are superb. And to this day, in my opinion, the only ones that truly show sympatric speciation in the sea. So they are amazing uh, milestones. And they show what you're expecting. That is that there is a phylogenetic relationship between Eastern and Western Pacific. What is interesting is that with genetics, you find occasionally puzzling results. And that's when it's most fun when you find uh, uh, things that surprise you. So for example, Girella is uh, uh, the opalize, or they are called the nibblers actually, uh, Girellids that are in the big group of the kyphosids. And uh, there is a, a group in, uh, in uh, Japan and a group in, uh, in California and, and back California, Negro Kansan Simplicidans on, on our side and on the other side. And so if you look at, we did a phylogeny of all the um, Girellids, and actually, those are not close, closely related at all. And so as much as the, the canonical view is that Eastern and Western Pacific are very closely related, there are some groups that they look exactly the same, but they're actually not closest relatives. So I find those kind of uh, results interesting, and that's what genetics help you uh, tease out. In the tropical Eastern Pacific, uh, there are some species that, are, that have strong affinities with the tropical Eastern Pacific when you're in California, just to give an example, the Sargo, of course, mostly uh, Southern California species, but also some, some species that we have uh, here in, uh, in, in Monterey Bay. Uh, but I, I did a lot of work in the tropical Eastern Pacific. The tropical Eastern Pacific is a very interesting place because um, it is somewhat isolated from anything else because between the tropical Eastern Pacific and where there is this big abundance of species that is in the Central Pacific, there's this huge Eastern Pacific barrier where there is just a huge space with nothing. There's no step, potential stepping stones for larvae, for example, to bridge that gap. And so there are very, very few species that bridge that gap, so few that we can actually show them. There's just very few species that you see in the tropical Eastern Pacific that are found in the rest of the Pacific. So almost everything is either endemic or closely related to the Western Atlantic. So this is what the region looks like. And in fact, uh, there is a very strong affinity, not with the rest of the Pacific, but rather with the, the Western Atlantic. Uh, the closure of the Isthmus of Panama happened anywhere between 2.8 and 3.5 million years ago, 3.1 million years ago. So we did a number of studies I, I won't go into all the details, but I will be more than happy to talk about it. But for example, in, if you take a genus of angelfishes, Holacanthus, there are two big clades of Holacanthus. They are the ones that are found in the, up here, the tropical Eastern Pacific, that is the, the there are three species, I'm gonna get to that in a second. Then there is a big clade in, uh, in the Western Atlantic, and then there is one ancestral species that is found in, in, the, in the Western Africa. And then there is, all this is actually related with Pygoplites, which is a, an angel fish that is found in the Indian Ocean. So what is interesting is that you can actually show this, but then you can say, well, is it really, uh, are they really closely related, the Western Atlantic and the tropical Eastern Pacific clades, or is it like Girella where it looks like they are close, but actually genetically they're not. And actually they are. Uh, this is a phylogen that is based on hundreds of uh, SNPs. This is done with genomic markers. And, and the, the phylogeny is very robust. And the divergence between the two clades, that is the Western Atlantic, and uh, maybe I should use the mouse so the people on, uh, on Zoom can see it. Uh, the, the Western Atlantic and the Tropical Eastern Pacific are separated, separated about 3.1 million years ago. So that matches about the the closure of the Isthmus of Panama. Now, um, one of the things that uh, is, uh, is important to, uh, to see is that in fact, you have also speciation that has happened within those ocean basins. And so that would be really interesting to look at how those species diverged within each one of those basins. And so in, uh, in the tropical Eastern Pacific, the genus Holacanthus, the angel fishes has three species 
The top one is the king angel fish. The middle one is the clarion agent fish. And the bottom one is the Clipperton angel fish. And the two bottom ones are endemic to small groups of islands or a single island. And passer is found all over from, from the Sea of Cortez all the way to Peru pretty much. And if you are uh, looking at uh, rad sequences with hundreds of uh, genomic SNPs, you can actually see that each pair of, uh, of uh, species is nicely differentiated. The FST is not very high because they did not diverge a very long time ago, but they are very nicely differentiated. And you can even do some uh, principal component analysis. And in a, in a DAPC, which is a, a, like, almost like pr principal component analysis, you see that the three species separate nicely. One of the things that is interesting is that just like a lot of other angel fishes, um, those ones also have hybrids. This is the group that is circled in black here, where you can see that they don't belong to either of, of any of the three species. And if you do a, what is called a structure plot, you can see that the, each individual is one a small uh, bar in this plot. And we have a whole bunch of, uh, of passer on the left that is in blue, Clarionensis is on orange and, and Limboa is on the is on uh, in green. And you see that the hybrids have exactly 50-50 of their genome because they are F1 hybrids. They are probably uh, either they are probably uh, uh, sterile hybrids, or we have never sampled any F2s or back crosses. And sure enough, when you're in the field, you actually can see occasionally some individuals that have intermediate colors. You see they're orange, but with the white bar of the other species. And you even see them swimming together. So they're definitely courting. So that's, this is the kind of stuff that you, you see it. And then when you do the genetics, it's kind of uh, satisfying to see um, these kind of, um, of patterns. Antitropical distributions are distributions of temperate species that are found in colder waters, but are absent from, from the equator. And we have a number of species in California that are mirrored in, uh, in the Southern Ocean. I mean, of course we have macrocystis and other seaweeds, but in the case of uh, fishes, there is a number of groups. This is an example of them, the clinids, which are the kelp fishes. Uh, then we have some uh, uh, giralis and opalis and semicosyphus, which is the California sheephead and the and Darwin sheephead. So in the case of the opali, which is the same drawing that I showed you earlier, you, uh, you can look also again at uh, the, the two groups that are in the Northern and the Southern hemisphere. And in this case, actually they do form a single clade. So there is a nice re uh, genetic relationship between, uh, between Northern and Southern hemisphere, but they are separate species, obviously. In the case of um, uh, sheephead, there is a California sheephead, Semicosophus pulker, and Darwini, the, uh, the semicosophus that is in, in the Southern hemisphere. Incidentally, I don't know if you are aware of the fact that Darwin collected some fish in the Galapagos, and this is one of the species that he collected. He collected 18 species, all of them endemic, and this is one of them. I mean, it was semi-endemic at the time. Um, but um, what is really interesting in this case, and this is why I pointed out now, is because you would expect them to be very, very separate species. But when you do, this was the very first study we did, which was done on, uh, on uh, mitochondrial DNA. And the big thing here means that almost, this is mostly pulker. So all the California sheephead have the same genotype, the same haplotype actually. And then there is a small branch that is very, very close. And this is the, the Darwini. Since then we have done, uh, a lot of work on microsatellites, and actually we've sequenced the full genome of Pulker now, and we've sequenced hundreds of genomes of these guys. And essentially, that's the reason we did it is because they are just incipient species. They are just slowly separating, if at all. So they're very, very closely related. It's, it's quite remarkable. And one of the hypotheses is that actually they are using deep reefs as stepping stones. These are animals that feed most on urchins. In, they can go in relatively deep water. And uh, they are occasionally found by submersibles rather deep. And they use those deeper seamounts to go between, to go under the warm water of the equator. So it's possible that actually very rarely they do migrate between 
between those areas. It's extremely rare, but it might happen, or this is at least the way they dispersed in, uh, in the first place. I think that you may probably, you are probably aware of uh, Mike Graham's uh, papers on, uh, on those deep, uh, deep kelp forests in the Galapagos, for example. So that's a little bit the idea. And so if you look at some, uh, some uh, uh, bathymetric maps of uh, these areas, there are sea mounts a little bit all over the place in the tropical eastern Pacific. So that kind of makes sense. So, so once you, you move away from species and you're looking into populations now, because now you're, you're bridging the gap between the species delim delimitation between full species and populations, you're looking into the, you're entering the realm of population genomics. And so most people that, many people that were originally doing a lot of phylogenies, which was my case, started being interested in population genomics because that's where the, where the film was, field was leading into. So um, I did a lot of work on population genomics of California fishes. I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but instead I will just talk about another uh, a uh, big part of uh, what we have been doing in the lab for a very long time, that is uh, the disjunct fishes that are found in uh, Southern California on the Pacific coast of Baja California and in the Sea of Cortez. But there are, these are fishes that are absent from the Southern tip of Baja California, the Baja California Peninsula. So this is the distribution of fishes. Actually, it goes a little bit further south than what is shown here, but the majority of the individuals are found just south of Punta Eugenia on the Pacific side of Baja California Peninsula. And then they're found in the northern part of the Sea of Cortez. So there are uh, 19 species of fishes that are, belong to 16 different families. So it's just a bunch of random uh, fishes that are fish species that are found in, uh, in, that are disjunct like this. The reason why disjunct species are really important to study is because physical disjunction is the very first step of allopatric speciation. So people that are interested in, in allopatric speciation and want to use population genomics to try to understand the first steps of speciation, that's uh, disjunctions are really interesting. And in the ocean, they are not that common actually. One of the power of genetics is that you can also um, test uh, alternative hypotheses of scenarios of how a situation has occurred, specifically in the case of uh, the Baja California Peninsula, the geology of the Baja California Peninsula is quite complex, but over time, um, seaways have been opening and closing and allowing migration of organisms between the Sea of Cortez and the uh, Pacific coast of the Baja California Peninsula. And so at some point, three million years ago, the peninsula was formed with, was made of three islands. And then uh, about one to 1.6 million years ago, there was a major, what is called mid-peninsula seaway. And then in present day time, kind of, in the last glacial maximum, the water temperature dropped everywhere. And because the water was much cooler at the tip of the Baja California Peninsula, then it was possible for temperate fishes to swim, to, to migrate around the, the tip of the peninsula. Again, we did a lot of work on this at a lot of different levels, but uh, the bottom line is these are mitochondrial trees. This is an older study of uh, a number of species. At that time, we, we, we worked on 16 out of the 19 species, I think. And what we found is that we found three major groups of species. There were species where the divergence between California, which is in black, and um, California, which is in black, and, uh, and the Sea of Cortez, which is in white, uh, is very deep divergence. So you see those very deep divergences. And then in some individuals, the divergence is not nearly as big. And then in some species, you cannot really see much divergence at all. And what we proposed at the time, and it's sort of held uh, over time, is that the three major scenarios of how uh, populations of fishes were able to migrate inside and outside of the Gulf and bridge the gap between the two distributions uh, is matched by those three different types of genetic patterns. And so you have those big sort of um, patterns of divergence between 
populations of different species of fishes between, between the Sea of Cortez and the Pacific coast. So we went a little bit deeper in a number of species. I'm going, just gonna give you one example, but we've done it with uh, several species. But this is a study that was done by Eric Garcia in the lab. Uh, and he worked on uh, Gilictis mirabilis, which is a species that uh, actually Cheryl worked quite a bit on, which is a goby uh, that is also disjunct. And uh, what we found was, again, using uh, uh, 4,000 uh, SNPs, 4,000 markers, uh, we found that there was a very strong divergence between Gulf populations and uh, Pacific populations. So we were refining the work that was done at the mitochondrial level using thousands of markers. So that was much better. And if you do a structure plot, you can actually see that when you look at neutral loci, there is a difference between the Pacific that has only almost only green clusters of uh, uh, genetic background with uh, this uh, green and red that is found in the Gulf in the Sea of Cortez. One of the things that uh, Eric was able to do was to distinguish between neutral loci and loci under selection. If you look at just those loci under selection, you find actually that the divergence between the two groups is quite uh, more pronounced. And the reason for it is because there is hardly any gene flow between the Sea of Cortez and the Pacific. And because of that, there is some local retention of larvae and the parents can actually predict what the environment of the larvae is going to be. And over time, they will be able to locally adapt to, their to, the, to the local environment. And eventually the uh, frequency of alleles in uh, the two different places is gonna be completely different because the uh, genes will be under selection. That's what is represented here. So this brings us to the third part, which is local adaptation. So local adaptation happens when organisms are able to, are not able, but when they, they are either selected or they're able to predict what the environment is gonna be. So this, uh, this is gonna be shown in, uh, in uh, two studies that I'm gonna show right now. One is, I don't know if I said this before, but all this is a fancy way of funding trips to cool places. I, I, I forgot to mention this in the first place, but so I thought, okay, where have I not been that I really want to go to? Obviously the Galapagos is one place. So, um, so I said, okay, the Galapagos is gonna be a good, a good candidate. So, so we did two things. First, when we went there, we thought, okay, maybe what we should do is to compare species that have very different distributions because the, the distribution of the species is a proxy for its dispersal capability. And because of that, you should be able to um, infer some potential for local adaptation that is different between different dispersal capabilities. And so uh, we sampled organisms that were either endemic to the islands or they were to the Galapagos archipelago, or that's the red individuals, or individuals that are uh, found in a bunch of different islands. So that would be in the Galapagos as well as in other islands such as Cocos Islands, for example, or Marpelo, or there is a number of other islands. Or uh, alternative to all this, they would be widespread that they are found everywhere. And so depending on where you are, uh, the genetic pattern that you should display should be quite different. And so we, uh, we selected a number of species that match those three patterns and the colors of the dots that I showed earlier match the colors of the frames of these pictures. So these are the species that we collected. And we did some um, uh, haplotype networks. And the idea was that in an individual that has uh, a very large distribution, you should have very large haplotype networks and one that has a small distribution, which have smaller haplotype networks, but with more difference. And essentially it's what was found, kind of. Actually quite, quite nice. So that was fine. 
But this was the old days. And, and so I revisited this uh, recently by saying, okay, I'm going actually to take an endemic species and I'm gonna determine if at the very smallest level, if it's possible to find some genes that are under selection that separate each island. As you know, I mean, I, I'm sure that everybody here knows that the Galapagos are famous for uh, displaying very strong inter-island genetic diversity for terrestrial organisms, such as iguanas, finches, uh, mockingbirds, and so on. So that's great for terrestrial organisms. And you can imagine how terrestrial organisms can be separated between islands. For marine organisms, it's a lot more complicated because they have pelagic larvae, and so they can migrate between islands quite readily. But in some cases, the pelagic larvae duration is short enough for them to have some retention uh, and some genetic differentiation between islands, potentially. So, um, whoa. this was done with uh, one goby, which is Lystripnus gilberti, and now we are uh, working with Cheryl, we're working on, on another species, which is called Dialamus. Uh, but uh, in the case of Lystripnus, uh, we uh, sampled them where there are the dots, and what is the reason why we can do it in the Galapagos is because the Galapagos are uh, subject to currents that make the islands very, very different. You probably know that in the Galapagos, you can see penguins and you can also see some very tropical birds. And it's very bizarre when you're there, but it's not exactly correct to say that because these animals are not exactly found in the same places. Some are but um, there are some islands that are very warm and other islands that are very, very cold. So there's a very strong uh, oceanographic gradient between those islands because of the types of currents that occur there. And so because of that, there was a potential at least for an environmental gradient that would then be reflected by strong selection of the genes of the organisms that are found there. So that was the, the idea. And essentially that's what was found, I'm just gonna show you one slide where this is a principal co component analysis uh, separation of the various places that were sampled. So being, if you were to do this with birds, each island would be completely different. And I'm not going to um, pretend that marine organisms are gonna display patterns that are as pretty as uh, terrestrial organisms. Nevertheless, you can see that some of the populations can be separated even when you are a marine organism, which is quite remarkable. And these are using loci under selection. So this means that organisms that are on different islands might have local adaptation that allows them to be perfectly adapted to a, a specific place. I don't have really time to go into the theory behind this, but this may be due to two uh, two mechanisms that are rather different. One is that there's just local retention and little by little you get adapted to a place. Another uh, possibility is that actually only those organisms that are adapted to a specific environment can survive. So when larvae show up on a reef, either they have the proper uh, genetic background that allows them to survive or they die. So there's selection that happens rather quickly and the organisms that you sample happen to have this genetic background. So the two scenarios are definitely possible and the uh, ultimate result is this. So we have not collected larvae, but uh, that's what it would be. A second example of uh, local adaptation that I want to talk about is in California. Uh, California is actually really nice. It's not nearly as striking as the East Coast of the United States, but the West Coast shows some very strong uh, uh, oceanogra oceanographic uh, gradients in uh, Northern California, north of Point Conception, the water in general tends to be colder than in Southern California. And because of that, we're expecting uh, gradients of uh, adaptation, particularly in organisms that have very little dispersal. The surf perches is the group of fishes that I work mostly on, which are organisms that uh, do not have a pelagic level stage. stage. They are internal fertilizers and they are brooders, they are viviparous species. So we, uh, Gary Longo in the lab, did a study where he took four uh, surf perches, uh, black striped 
uh, Rabelev and Pyle. Uh, the two top ones are animals that tend to be really reef associated on the bottom usually, uh, while the, other, the, the two bottom ones here are the ones that tend to live more, uh, they are more demersal, they live more in the, in the higher canopy and they tend to disperse a lot more as adults. Uh, and uh, he sampled them in, uh, in Monterey and in, uh, and in Mexico to try to get the two extremes of the, of the distribution of those organisms. He found that uh, for structure, the ones that are reef associated show very, very strong population structure. This is with neutral loci. And uh, the two that are closer to the canopy do show, this one shows quite a bit of difference. This one doesn't show much difference, but actually if you do the statistics, there are population differences between Northern and Southern uh, uh, distributions. And after that, he looked specifically at genes under selection. This is uh, graphs that show the relationship between uh, heterozygosity and FST. And when you are outside a certain area, you become an outlier lo locus, which is a, a locus under selection. And it's either at the top up here, then you're under directional selection, or if you are at the very bottom, it's not shown here, you're under balancing selection. So you are lower than expected or higher than expected um, FST slash heterozygosity. So he did that for uh, the four species. And what he found was very, very interesting. First of all, uh, there is a number of, uh, of loci that are either on the balancing selection. This is in the blue or divergent selection. The numbers show the number of loci and after the comma is the number of protein coding genes that are under selection. The other ones are just uh, loci of non-coding regions. I don't know. So these are a number of examples of uh, genes that are under selection. I won't go too much into the details. If anyone is interested, I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss it. Uh, since then, we've sequenced the genome of uh, Ambiotoga jacksoni, the black surf perch, just to make sure, and actually we sequenced also the, the striped and the rainbow, but this was just to know if all the low sign the selection were in, on one chromosome or if they were distributed along the entire genome. And the genes and the selections are those red dots and they're found. Each one of those gray or black areas are a different chromosome. And uh, the red dots are the low sign of the selection. And you see that they are distributed all around the genome. So it's not that there's one part of the genome that's on the selection and the rest is not. It's, it's pretty widespread. That was the first finding. Another thing that I thought was really, really interesting is that when you look at populations that are north and south in each species independently, you actually find a number of genes that are in common between species. Uh, so for example, these are orthologous uh, marker that is not a known protein, but it's a non-coding region that is found in common between this one is between uh, the pile and the black. There is one locus that has this property. And so, uh, and, and all the other ones are, are, uh, are shown as well. And then you have some, uh, uh, regions that are in protein cod coding regions, or in some cases they are in protein coding regions, but in different parts of the protein itself. So uh, that was evidence for parallel evolution where independently those populations have selected some genes or some genomic regions that are under selection to adapt to different environments. So that was, uh, that was really, really interesting. I've got, we're supposed to finish at five, right? Around five, I have a, a few more minutes, few minutes. Okay, I will talk about assessing the past, predicting the future. Assessing the past, I don't know about you guys, but I don't really believe ge in genetics very much. I teach it <laughs> and, I, and I say, this is really what it is. But then at the end of the day, I'm not completely sure that what I'm saying has any bearing with reality. And so I swim a lot in a lot of places and I count fish. This, I can, I, I believe it, you know, you just see when you count it. But then you do the genetics and they say that there is a, and I'm not sure. So I said, before we are going to assess the past, maybe we should just ground truth the, the method. And I did this experiment 
knowing full well that it would not work, and it did. And very often, I, it's like a little bit like, you know, when we look at uh, those populations that are across the isthmus of Panama, you do the molecular clock and it's 3 million years. It's exactly when the Panama, uh, the isthmus of Panama closed. And I said, how is it possible? This is like magic, you know? And this is the same thing. This is a work that I did with my wife, Nicole Crane, who is an alum from, from this school. And uh, so she went to Clipperton. Uh, to, we, had to, we had to take care of the kids. And so one had to go to Clipperton and the other one had to go to the Philippines. And I said, I really want to go to the Philippines. You go to Clipperton. So she went there, I took care of the kids. She came home, took care of the kids and I went to the Philippines. And I think I lost out because the Clipperton was an awesome trip. But anyway, she went to Clipperton and, uh, and uh, we decided to focus our attention on endemic species. Clipperton is tiny and it's a very, very small atoll. It's owned by France. Don't get me started. And, and what happened is that um, there are some species that are only found on that, on that tiny rock, nowhere else. So I thought, wow, they claim that with genetics, you can actually determine the number of individuals in a species. Where else can you do it uh, any better than a Clipperton? It's very small, you can count them and then you're done. So I said, okay, let's do this. We're gonna count the fish then we're gonna take a bunch of them, do the genetics, and then try to relate genetics and visual counts. That was the idea. So uh, this, is, this is where all the visual counts were done by a number of expeditions. We uh, com compiled all the visual counts of fish transects and of those two species. They are only found there, they're never found anywhere else. So the visual counts, Let's not uh, be bogged down by details. Essentially, Baldwini is 10 times more abundant than uh, Limboa, which is the uh, damsel is 10 times more abundant. And you know, when you, I saw, I didn't go there, but she took tons of videos and I looked at the videos, give or, let, give or take, that's about right. And it's about uh, 3, 10.3, 4, 10.4, 40, 10.4. Now you can do the genetics and then you have some, uh, uh, methods of coalescence that can determine what the population size is just looking at the, the genetic variability of the individuals. And so I said, okay, is there any relationship whatsoever? And I was totally shocked. It's actually quite close. I mean, it's a 10 time. So this one, this one is 35, this one is five, but 10 to the three, seven, six, 48, 10 to the four, this one, the, the, the order of magnitude is the same. The numbers are actually, more similar than I expected, to be honest. And so I thought, wow, this is kind of, kind of cool. It actually works. So once I was convinced that the method was working, then there is a new method that came out that I find absolutely fascinating. And I'm starting now to think that maybe it has something to do with reality. That is the idea that you can actually estimate the population size of an individual over time when you sequence his genome. So in the lab, Remy Gatins uh, sequenced the genome of Holacanthus passer. So Buscos is a way of determining if the genome is good or not. It, it, it tells you how many uh, uh, genes you've sequenced that correspond to what is in the bank and hers was great, so that was fine. And you can do what is called a PSMC. A PSMC, well, I don't have time to explain exactly how it works, but I'm happy to discuss it over the non-BR outside later on. But uh, the idea is that you are going to segment artificially the genome in very small fragments. And the amount of recombination that you will find between the two chromosomes is going to be related with population size at a given time, depending on the size of what you cut. And uh, this is what she found. What she found is you get uh, this PSMC graph with a single genome and it gives you, this is population size over time. So this is in millions of years. So this is 10 million years, this is now, and this is the population size. So as you can see, as you get closer, there is a lot more um, uncertainty, but this is the closure of the Isthmus of Panama. We know that that population has to be small because it didn't exist at the time. So this is essentially the baseline, and this is pretty low, which is great, so what you're hoping. And then you start going up and uh, this is 1 million years, 100,000 years, 10,000 years ago. And 
the population is starting to creep up at that time. If you, you probably don't remember what the original phylogenetic tree was, that the one that I showed you about the, the holacanthus, but at 1 million years when that population starts expanding. So that matches really nicely the original phylogeny. And uh, it, it goes up, then at some point it, it comes down a little bit and then it goes back up again. And actually it matches quite nicely the beginning of the uh, big glaciations where seawater level dropped and it had a very, very strong effect on populations. This is known with a lot of fishes all around the world. And you can see it by sequencing a single genome. So that's one of the, if, if you're familiar with PSMC, you may have seen very interesting papers on uh, the behavior of populations of uh, polar bears, for example, that track very well the various glaciations because obviously uh, the, the ice is directly related with uh, populations of polar bears. So that was, that was done, that was really good. Last thing that I want to talk about is predicting the future. As you know, the ocean is not doing super well. And this is mostly due to warming and acidification. So I've done uh, a little bit of work with um, uh, Cheryl and Scott. I say a little because they did everything and I was just trying to look pretty in the back. But we also did some stuff uh, uh, in the lab as well. And um, this is what I'm gonna talk about. So we did some work on uh, black surf perch, which is a species that I've mostly focused uh, my work on. And what we did is that we put them in, in uh, extreme conditions. These are the pHs, in very extreme conditions, static conditions. So those guys were for a month at those pHs. And then we dissected the muscle and the brain, looked at the RNA expression, and looked at how differentially expressed genes were in the two treatments. And this is what the result looks like. And I want you to focus on two things. One is the fact, so let me first explain what this looks like. Each one of these columns, you can somewhat see that these are columns, uh, is one individual. So it's here there are four individuals, here there are three individuals, here there are four and there are four. So there are the, the treatments, each individual is a column. Each one of those lines is a gene, and if it's underexpressed is green, and if it's overexpressed is red. The two things, and then there's a bunch of genes that are not different, and they are in between those, those, two, those two graphs, essentially. So first of all, obviously, there is this huge difference in expression, either overexpressed, underexpressed, or the opposite in many, many genes, both in muscle and brain. But another thing that is really interesting is that, especially for those fishes, that do not show a lot of genetic variability within the population because they do not have any dispersal. So they are uh, uh, genetically very, um, they have very low diversity within the population. All these individuals were actually collected in Elkhorn Slough. Is that with, between individuals, you don't see much variation at all. We did a bunch of replicates because we had to, but the reality of it is that if we only had one individual in each treatment, the result would be exactly the same. There's no, not much variation at all. So that was really interesting. And then of course, the fact that there's so much uh, variability between the, between the things. So uh, this is the number of genes that were uh, differentially expressed. And in muscle, you have a number of genes that are uh, extremely different between the treatments uh, for the brain. Uh, GABA receptor is a classic gene that we find in the brain in differentially expressed uh, experiments that deal with ocean acidification is very, very common. And in this case, we have a uh, epidemic as well, which was actually the most differentially expressed gene. And later I found a paper that did a similar thing on salmon, if I remember well. And what they have found was uh, again, si similarly, GABA and ep epidemic was also the same thing. So the, the bottom line is that our results match nicely uh, what had been found. So in a scenario of future oceans, you have this huge uh, difference in uh, gene expression in those two organs and in uh, many other ones as well. 
we we found this and i said well you know this is kind of cool but i does it have anything to do with reality so jason toy uh, in the lab uh, who works also with christy croker uh, thought of doing an experiment that was a lot more realistic and a lot better first of all using a lot more replicates and also doing this so this graph shows five treatments there are three treatments. See, these are temperature treatments over days. So this goes from zero to 30 days, so one month. And this is various levels of pH that are more realistic than the ones I had done. And three experiments, it's what is called a static experiment. The top one is whatever water comes in from the outside. And then the, these ones are uh, waters that, are, uh, that we manipulate, but they are kept constant. And then there is a big difference in California. <coughs> we have um, upwellings. And so there is a natural variation of pH in the water that we have. And so he thought, okay, we're going to vary uh, the pH over time to somewhat mimic uh, uh, natural upwellings. He kind of knew what upwellings should be like. And so he sort of guesstimated how it should look like. As it turns out, because Jason is so accurate with his things, this is the actual measurements of the water in his tanks. The top one is actually water that comes in and there was an upwelling event that happened just when he started his experiment that matches exactly what his treatments are, which was kind of ironic because, so, so actually his treatments are quite realistic because it worked out exactly how how the, the raw water comes in. And so the idea was, can we actually replicate the original study that I had done where we see that all the individuals are exactly the same or are the individuals gonna be quite different when you are in a variable environment? And this is what the results are. So this, these graphs <coughs> show the variance between individuals according to treatments. So you have two static treatments, which is this one and that one, and they have the lowest variance, which correspond to the original uh, graphs that I showed you where between individuals, you don't have much variance at all. And these ones are the variable experiments, this one and that one. And so when you look at that, there is actually a lot more variability between individuals uh, when you do those treatments, when you simulate those upwelling uh, systems. So I, I found that quite fascinating and a lot more realistic. It's, it's the genes are still strongly differentially expressed, but it's a lot more realistic and a lot more variable than, you know, just doing what everybody else does actually in the world. That is, you put them at one pH, you put them on another one, you wait 30 days and then you see what happens. So this one is a lot more realistic. So this was a brief view of some of the things that we do, trying to uh, explain how genetics can be really fun in this uh, area of the world. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this, uh, this whirlwind uh, tour of uh, what we do. A number of people in the lab have strongly contributed to this work. Obviously, Remy, uh, Jason and Gary did a lot of the experiments that I talked about. And then uh, Daniel Wright is another grad in the lab that is doing a ton of experiments comparing California and South Africa, which is very, very interesting. And Nicole has been doing a lot of work with me for the last 30 years. And uh, Pete and Mark at uh, UC Santa Cruz are people that I work with a lot. And then I want to thank my funding agencies. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are any questions. Time for a non-beer. <laughs> this, this is sad. Oh, Zoom. But I think that, I don't know if anyone is in the back. Oh, good. Shall I go ahead? Um, 
Do any of those have to do with temperature adaptation? Uh, so next week we're going to get the fish. You're going to get an email tomorrow about, about exactly what to do. We are going actually to do a, a, a RNA expression work exactly to look at that between the Sea of Cortez and, and here. The answer is yes. One of the, this was done with rads. One of the great things with rads is that it's really easy. You have a nice um, description of what the genome looks like. But each sequence is about 100 base pairs. And the regions that are under selection are close to genes. And if you don't have the genome, you don't know which genes are under selection. So the answer to your question is yes, we identified some genes that are related to that. But, it, but I want now to do actual experiments where we're going to uh, extract the RNAs and see that. So that's, we're starting this experiment next week. Well, I mean, we're going to Baja next week. Go ahead, Scott. I like the type of population size map the clipper. I thought that was pretty interesting. I was kind of curious how well those metrics reflect like the current population size versus something that's maybe in the recent past. Like if you have a species that's increasingly good commercially efficient population, it's been fairly recently dropped down. Does it still do a good job or does it really change the I guess what's the time scale of the change that yeah. uh so um over time, I've made a point in specifically working on fish that are not commercially important, exactly to avoid that, <laughs> because, because it's um, not nearly as uh, relevant or nicely funded, but is just specifically to avoid that issue. Strangely enough, um, the only study that I've seen that has address this has been uh, studies that have been done on elephant seals and on black abalone because both populations have crashed massively due to two completely different reasons. And in fact, it takes many generations through the bo bottleneck to affect those metrics. So it does, but up to, I mean, it, it, it is quite resilient to that. And there is a number of papers that have addressed that very question. This is fundamental, but uh, it, is, uh, it is not very vulnerable to, uh, to population crashes. And so in a sense, it's good for an evolutionary biologist, less so for a fisheries biologist because they would like to know what's going on now. And actually uh, genes are not very good for that. You, you can do other types of things, but not that. Um, I'm thinking about those genes that are uh, uh, outliers or under selection, and we've looked at a bunch of these genes, and then there are these other genes that when you put these genes down under variable conditions, you're like, okay, these are the genes that are changing, being regulated and modulated with pH. So you, I can imagine multiple scenarios where you're like, oh, okay, the genes under selection are becoming canalized, they're warm in the box, they're cold over here. They're becoming more and more restricted. Or they might be genes that are saying, hey, you can have further and further tolerances. Yeah. I, I, I don't exactly know what I'm asking, but I think that there's probably not very many people who are looking at these things, but I think we are. We might have we, we only put them out of the hand on the kind of data set and think about it. Yeah. Do you see any kind of patterns or can you make predictions? Well, um, there is one further thing that is even worse than what you're talking about is that some adaptation is probably epigenetic and you would not be able to pick it up with this. And so I think that in my simple mind, I think that it is related with for how long have species been exposed to a specific environment. And so uh, when you have, and so you have those acute responses that are very transitory and then you have responses that last for several generations, this has been shown. And then you have long-term uh, changes that are going to be seen at the evolutionary level. And so, uh, for example, if you, have, uh, if you were to look at uh, between uh, the Western Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific, which are conditions that are very different, organisms have been separated for 3 million years. So I presume that things are gonna be very, very different. Then you have organisms that have been separated for 10,000 years, 
and then you have uh, organisms that are treated for 30 days. So that's quite different. Right. Like I'm just trying and to so that's that, that's a little bit the yeah. The yeah, so, yeah. But we've been having upwell in California for you know, however many years. Oh, yeah, yeah. So those guys are under selection to maintain the variable response for a long time. So I'm just trying to figure out like where are, you got your red outliers. Do you predict a little cloud of genes that, you know, I don't know, just say for the example of uh, adaptation, local adaptation to this variation in upwell. Would they be in the gray cloud or, uh, I guess they might be in the red cloud on California, but then how will it relate to this stuff? And, I don't know. Uh, I'm just trying to try there, to express with these things. There is a relationship between uh, selection strength and signal. And so uh, if the selection strength is very, very strong, like for, to give an extreme example, we are taking, uh, we are taking vaccines for those of us that are smart enough. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then you have you know, new variants that show up. So the, the selection is very strong and the response is very visible. But when the, the selection is not very strong, then, then it's less visible. And so I think that that's, that's essentially the, the, the balance that you're looking at. And so if, so I think that the, the, what happens with the Jason's experiment is that it's exactly what you're saying. What I failed to, to do in the experiment that I did early on is to recognize that actually, if you are a lot more subtle in the way you're setting up your experiment, will actually realize that the organisms are very well adapted to a changing pH within a certain amount of, of variability. And then once you pass beyond that, then, then, uh, then they're not adapted anymore. Super interesting thing, Yeah, yeah, I want to, this is why, uh, I mean, I did not uh, emphasize that, but the, even within the variable treatments, there were two different levels. It was varying, but the extremes were different. Yeah, he had different treatments, just to address that question. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, question in the chat. Thankfully, someone is paying attention here. Huh. Uh, wow. I'm not sure that I know exactly how to answer that question. Um, how long would it take for organized history? Right, history. So how how old, so I mean the TP. In fact, uh, most of the Western because we are so focused on us, we have the impression that a lot of organisms came from the Western Atlantic into here. It's actually is the opposite that happens. Um, so I need to think about this for a second. I don't know exactly how the question can be answered properly because the TEP officially starts at the closure of the Isthmus of Panama. So you cannot be more than 3.1 million years. But before that, there were other species that were there. And so they were not truly endemic to the TEP because it didn't exist. So I, I'm not exactly sure what the question is. But um, yeah, I mean, there's the endemicity of, uh, of the TEP is, is, is big. I mean, it's not enormous. I think it's 20% maybe. 20% of species are endemic to the TEP, if I remember correctly, give or take. So that's not enormous, but I think the largest, the most endemic, uh, place on earth, I think is for fishes is Hawaii. And I think it's 37%, I think. So it's not, it's not a huge amount. So yeah, it's up 20%. That was a question we got. Good. I was not able to answer. I'm really sorry, Brian. You stumped me, <laughs> which is a good thing. Very good. Oh, another question, go ahead.
fish have anxiety because <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl, do you know the answer to this? Uh, all, all I know, uh, I will let uh, Cheryl uh, comment on this because it's not exactly my field, but the paper that I showed uh, were, um, it was an experiment, if I, I haven't read the paper in a long time, but if I remember well, it was an experiment where they specifically put fish in stressful situations. So I don't know if it's related with that at all, but that's what I vaguely remember about that paper. Uh, but I don't know, maybe Cheryl has some uh, insight on this because we have talked about GABA quite a yeah, bit. It's also been challenging because I thought about it, but GABA, there's a, it's a neurotransmitter and there's a reversal of the direction that the GABA is going in under its anticipation of fish. Um, and that results in changes in behavior. I can't remember. It originally has an age old fashion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So maybe yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they definitely did. We would appreciate questions that we can answer. <laughs> that would be that would make our life a little bit easier thank you that would be better we're done with the zoom people good oh one more wait is there one more yeah so um I don't know if you, everybody has, has asked the question. It's about uh, linkage disequilibrium and the uh, and the population size. So there are different ways of um, of uh, estimating population size, and one of them is using link, linkage disequilibrium. There is a really great paper about this by Robin Waples, of course, and um, the answer is yes. In uh, in if you go back to the paper on Clipperton, which uh, is published, you will see that we use the number of uh, estimates and uh, LD was one of them and it works really well. So the answer to that question is yes. There you go, you finished on one you can answer. I know, <laughs> very good. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>